Christiana Kahakawila, and I'm a um, fellow here, the Lisa Goldberg Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute. Um, and it's a delight and great gift to be able to introduce Lucy Tapahanzo, the inaugural Poet Laureate of the Navajo Nation. I'd like to begin by honoring the Wampanoag, Massachusetts, and other area tribes on whose land we gather this afternoon. I first came to Lucy's writing a couple of years ago when I was looking for examples of communal storytelling, of how communities or families, <clears throat> excuse me, families talk story time, as we Hawaiians might put it, could be translated onto the page. When I discovered Lucy's books, I found the intimacy of that talk story time recreated in the written line. The act of reading, usually done individually, silently felt with Lucy's writing to be communal and raucous, as if the entire household of relatives was there speaking and I, the reader, were inside the Hogan with them. And if in her writing I was surrounded by the voices of her community, her husband and daughters, her grandchildren and parents, her grandmother and great-grandmother and sisters and brothers, I also had such a sense of Lucy's writerly voice, the clarity of it, these clean, straightforward lines, and words that conveyed to me not just happening, the fact of a moment, but its visceral experience and meaning as well. Indeed, when Lucy discusses her relationship with storytelling, she highlights the power of words, in an interview with Mojave poet Natalie Diaz, Lucy said, quote, in Navajo, the idea of words or language is really our origin. We were created by words, and we survived by words. Everything that comprises a Navajo person is based on words. You can, your clan, where you come from, how the world was created. She goes on, they say that when the world was first created, the holy people thought about it, then organized their thoughts, and then their thoughts were expressed in words. As they spoke, the Navajo idea of the world or universe was created. Certainly, the language of Lucy's poems and stories begets universes, those of Shiprock, New Mexico, and Lawrence, Kansas, of her lifetime and lifetimes long ago. She suggests also universes of emotion, from the sly humor and two-stepping meter of In Praise of Texas, to the wistful ode to her brothers in These Long Drives. To read Lucy's poems is to tumble into a multitude of universes, all connected by her use of language and a deep sense of the aliveness of the Navajo people. Lucy Tapahanzo is descended from Bitterwater clan on her father's side and Saltwater clan on her mother's. She was born in Shiprock, New Mexico, and grew up in a family of 11 children. Her first language is Navajo, though, as she told us yesterday, her parents taught her English numbers and letters prior to her starting school at the Navajo Methodist Mission, a boarding school in Farmington, some 30 miles from Shiprock. She began her career as a reporter and in an interview with the Los Angeles Review of Books said of those more youthful days that she was, quote, out there with AIM running around, <laughs> end quote. In 1976, she enrolled at the University of New Mexico where she earned her BA and MA and became a professor of English, women's studies, and American Indian studies. She would go on to teach at the University of Kansas where she was key in establishing the indigenous studies graduate studies program, and at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Today, she has returned to the University of New Mexico as a professor and the director of their MFA program in creative writing. Her first book was published in 1981, a year after she graduated with her BA, that, that we all could be so lucky. Uh, <laughs> since then, she has published five more collections of poetry and short stories, as well as three children's books. Her numerous awards and recognitions include a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Native Writers Circle of the Americas, 
Storyteller of the Year by the Wordcraft Circle of Native Writers, and the Region Book Award from the Mountain and Plains Booksellers Association. She has also served on the Board of Trustees of the National Museum of the American Indian and is a juror for the Poetry Society of America. In 2013, when she was named inaugural poet of the Navajo Nation, she, um, in speaking of this honor, hearkened back to the idea of community. For me, she said, to think about the laureate is like that same idea of honor, how people use words, words that aren't really mine, that are from our language, from our history, is not even really me, you know. It is everything that people over the generations and over the centuries have deemed beautiful. Lucy Tapahansa. Thank you so much. It's very much an honor. Yeah. Yeah, I should not. She a Lucy Kapahatso, the Shishne. Put a question, she do it, put it in in Bashish chain. There's cheating that she chayed, dog, and the cheating that she nulla. Not on in as the Egesina Sha. A good album that son, Shle. Good afternoon. I'm very honored to be here, and I want to express my gratitude to Shelley and Paul and Alan, every, both Alans, and everyone else who has been instrumental in um, my visit here. And I want to say thank you to my, to my grandson, my son Damon. He's my been a really good Indian guide. <laughs> I want to begin this afternoon by reading a poem for my intelligent and lovely granddaughter, Brianna. She um, arrived yesterday, and I haven't seen her since January, so it's really nice to be with her. This is called Shitsui. For Brianna Nesba Edmo. Thank you. She was born on a bright fall afternoon, already chubby and quivering with wetness. She gasped for air and for her mother's warm body. Her name is She Who Brings Happiness because upon being carried, she instinctively settles into the warmth of your shoulder and neck. She nestles like a little bird into the contours of your body. All you can say is, she's so sweet, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and we smile, beaming with pleasure. She sleeps even breaths and milky sighs just below your ear. Other times she snuggles into you and watches with bright, dark eyes. It feels so much like the trust we have somehow forgotten over the years. All you can do is kiss her warm forehead and say, she's so sweet, I don't know what to do. Sometimes when I haven't seen her for a day or even a week, she runs to me, her arms straight out for balance, and hugs my legs. My gamma, she murmurs into my skirt. Then she holds her arms up and says, ah, ah, and I pick her up. She snuggles into me, sighing. Then I tell her, my little one, my daughter's child, what happiness you are to me. She cries a little, ah, like the infant she no longer is. 
and I hold her like the sweet surprise she will always be. We sit like that a while, then she hums, hey, Naya. I take the hint and sing the old lullaby her great-grandmother sang to the child I once was. Hey, Naya, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, Naya, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, Naya, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, hey, young. Hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, hey, young. Oh, hey, oh, hey, nay, young. Oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, nay, young. She shifts on my lap saying, star, star. We turn to the twinkling Christmas lights still up in July and sing, twinkle, twinkle, little star. She falls asleep and I hand her to her mother saying, She's so sweet, I don't know what to do. Now each time she toddles into the room, we turn and say, You want some juice? How about milk? She who brings happiness smiles and climbs onto the nearest lap. As she snuggles comfortably into the circle around the table, we murmur, She's so sweet. We don't know what to do. Thank you. Brianna is now um, on a congressional internship in DC. So, and she's still so sweet. <laughs> I just love having family with me when I travel and have these kinds of events. It just is such a, it's just so comforting. And um, I'm not as uh, nervous as I may, might be otherwise. This is a poem called State of the, it's not really a poem, it's a letter. Um, a couple of years ago, NPR asked me to take part in a series which was called State of the Reunion. And they asked a number of uh, writers from across the country to write uh, letters to their hometowns. So it was perfect for me. So this is a letter that I wrote to Shiprock, my hometown. Dear Shiprock, my home, my land, my mother. Yat eh nat ani ne shiteya shavandoshama. I introduce myself again as a Tohni from the Mesa Farms. I am from Shiprock, the huge rock formation whose name translates into tall leader or the rock with wings. Nat ani ne stent nasha, tsepet at dent nasha. Nat ani ne se igisi nasha, tsepet at den nasha, tohti shikeya. Ni yajun shle, shiprak, I'm one of your thousands of children who will always honor your dark blue silhouette that is surrounded by flat land, the shallow San Juan River, fields, orchards, and irrigation ditches. Remember me? I grew up on first lane on a seemingly nondescript farm, but we were taught that we were wealthy because of our fields and animals. Oh, Shiprock, as a tall leader, you remain resolute, towering into the empty New Mexico sky. You are the echo of a time when eagles spoke to us and nurtured us. Long ago, you brought us here rescuing us from a world of horrendous floods and Roman monsters. We nestle then in the, view, in the V of your huge golden wings, secure in that warm instinctual place, secure in that warm instinctual cradle now known as Ke. Our Navajo memories treasure that smooth alighting long ago and the soft landing near the thin, clear river. Our name became Tohni, people of water, in honor of the river that would ensure our livelihood. 
Thus, to be from shipwreck, to be on not on Ines, is to know ourselves as ancient and resilient. We strive daily to embody the ways of Keh, kindness, strength, compassion, and to remember all living things understand kinship. Each morning, the holy ones arrive at sunrise with blessing songs. Then at dusk, they enfold us in gentle blankets of brilliant colors wrought from the mountain sunlight fields and stars. Shiprock not on inez tsepet a nihima. To say your name recalls old stories, treasured memories of family, relatives, and friends. Your names are replete with hugs, tears, and laughter. Ashunet Shikeya, the days are crisp and cold again. The Navajo New Year has begun. The blending of fall and winter calls forth the ceremonies of the Ye'ebiche, grandfathers of the Holy Ones. They pray and sing in the frost-filled nights. They dance again for our renewal, the plants, animals, fields, and our good health. Once again, they sing the old stories and the blessings of our ancestors within the watchful view of Shiprock. Thank you, Shiche, Shinala, Shamasanado, Shama, Shijea, Shiprock, for your enduring presence and the lasting reminder that we are cared for and look after, no matter where we may travel. Yours sincerely, Lucy Tkabahatsa. Thank you. I want to... Um, um, earlier today, or maybe it was yesterday, I talked about um, poetry and form and how much I love form, writing in a Western traditional form. When I was um, in school, when I was an undergraduate, I was studying you know, poetry, or maybe in graduate school. And I was really kind of daunted and put off by having to learn um, and memorize Western poetry, um, poetry from Europe that originated in Europe. And um, I just couldn't understand the language, the form. I just couldn't understand it. And so um, I, I, I knew that I, I had to learn it like I was getting a grade. <laughs> And I remember talking to my mother, and I told her, I, am, I don't know what I'm going to do because it's really hard for me. I said, it's, a, it's already kind of hard to always be writing in English, but to write, to understand old English is really hard. Um, and um, she just listened to me, and um, she said, um, well, whenever you can, this is when I was in Albuquerque, she said, come home and um, let's arrange a prayer for you. She said, because maybe that's what you need is just to come home and have some prayers and listen to, you know, some songs and let us just all get together for you to help you. And um, she didn't under really have an understanding of what I meant, except that I was having a hard time. Mm -hmm. So I so they did. They arranged for um, a, a, a ceremony for me and had the medicine man told all my relatives and everything. And so I came back and um, I think it lasts two nights, maybe three nights. So we stayed up all night. And as part of that, when the medicine man says the prayer, you have to repeat after him. So uh, it's really. Um, kind of strenuous if you're not used to it. But overall, you there's like, I don't know, 40 or 50 people that have gathered for you. And they're all praying, and they're all, you know, there for you. They've, and um, so 
um, I remember when I was repeating things after the medicine man, I just had my eyes closed and I was repeating after him. Then when he was singing and praying, I had my eyes closed and I was thinking, uh, I was thinking his voice is re really rhythmic. It's poetic. He's repeating things. In Navajo, you repeat things four times. And I was just thinking about that. And then I thought, what if that was written down? And as I was listening to his voice, I could visualize in my mind what it looked like. And then I realized it looked like a fixed form poem. <laughs> and I thought, oh, and it was all in Navajo. And it was, he was praying things that were, we don't even know the beginning of them, but it was the exact same as my ancestors and my parents that had, that had been prayed for them and given to them. And then it was being done for me. And there was all these people who loved me and wanted only the best for me. It was such a liberation. I can't tell you how grateful I was. So then I went back and I saw it with a new appreciation because I knew that this form that I was trying to study was older. My, my knowledge and my prayers and my words were older than what I was trying to learn. So then it was a breeze. <laughs> I just had to understand the concept and see how it was related to me. After that, then, you know, I really appreciated everything I did because I could see it through the lenses of a Navajo person, not as a person that's foreign to the language, but to understand that they too loved and appreciated language. They too memorized those words, and we have them today. So anyway, then after that, I was writing sonnets and villanelles. <laughs> and then my favorite is the Sestina, which I'm going to read now. Sestina, as you may know, is a, called the Song of Sixes. It uses six words in a particular order, has six stanzas. The words appear, the six words that appear at the end of each line. Then it be, ends with a three-line stanza in which three um, three of the words are in the center and the other three are at the end of the line. And then what made it even better was I was able to use Navajo in English. It's like, uh, it was, this was made for me. <laughs> this is called Tzili. And the, re, the, the, um, the meaning becomes clear at, uh, at the end. Sometimes this guy just makes me laugh. Just as easily he can make me see red, like when he tries to run off as, he th as if he thirsts for freedom. Anyway, he needs me like a dog needs a pack. Besides, he loves my crew cab truck. When he first noticed my jewelry, I became the woman for him. Not only that, but because I'm a Diné woman, his life revolves around me. Now he recognizes my laugh from a distance. Sometimes we go for rides in the truck down winding river road as the sky fills with purple and red streaks. To the south, people walk along the Rialto, their dogs' noses bent to the ground. The dogs are, are excited and thirsty. <coughs> A Diet Coke is enough to quench my thirst. In the Southwest, the quintessential pleasures for women are a faithful car, good music, and good stories. We're not dogged by having to drive hundreds of miles. We just reminisce, laugh, and sometimes sing. During trips north to Shiprock, dusk turns everything red as the vast Salt River Canyon welcomes my truck. It is as we used to say, we keep on trucking through whatever may come our way. Our thirst for stories and laughter never ceases. Once I read that animals make life complete, 
But a woman like me needs more than that, I thought and laughed. Then I remembered the cats, rabbits, chickens, and dogs of my childhood. How Lobo, Snazzy, and Toki didn't seem like dogs. They listen ever alert while lying under daddy's truck. They probably never really slept. Sometimes they even seemed to laugh when we spoke English. But back to this other guy. He thirsts to be near me, even when I'm driving. Move over, I say. A woman needs space and no distractions. Sit on your side before red lights come flashing. I'll be handcuffed and read my rights, and you won't even care. Act like a dog and look out the window, I score. <laughs> he knows when a woman means business. He moves slowly over to the passenger side door and looks at me, his dark, shiny eyes thirsty for affection. He gets that same look when I laugh unexpectedly. And he doesn't laugh when I talk English like those res dogs. But those dogs instilled in me, instilled in me, a thirst for a sleek little dog, a Tzili, who loves trucks and lives only to make his mom a happy woman. Thank you. This is about my little dog. His name um, was Max Cornichet. He was um, a miniature pincher. And he was my, he stuck with me for the whole 12 years of his life. He was my little buddy and he used to go to readings with me. And I would hold him and then when I was signing books, he would sit on my lap. <laughs> he was just a, yeah, he was my little my little guy, and now we still have his little brother, Buddy. And he's really my husband's dog. And so Max could really understand Navajo. Um, Buddy, not really, but, um, <laughs> but we always say that Buddy's name is Buddy Martin. Because <laughs> 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 his breed, a miniature pincher, originated in Germany. So we gave him like a little German, German name, kind of, I think. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. So I want to um, just read a couple of things. I want to read this poem about, um, about a trip to Italy. And um, uh, it's called Festival of the Onion. Fall mornings in Umbria are veiled with dew. Roosters awaken the dawn. I hadn't heard that wake-up call since childhood. And there is coffee that makes one happy to be alive. Delicate tiny cups filled with the dark essence that means Italia. To drink this is to start the day murmuring, grazie, grazie. From the balcony where we eat breakfast, we see olive groves cling to the gentle hills in the distance. Transparent clouds pause and rest on the rises. I breathe the crisp air and thank the holy ones. Later, areas drift from a home nearby. The cobblestone lanes are narrow and shiny from centuries of use. Tiny roads weave between the old houses and castles. Walls are worn smooth from the handiwork of families over the ages. The round corners and slight indentations convey the tenderness of home and long ago grandparents. One evening we attended an onion festival in Camarillo. It was like a miniature shiprock fair without the dust and mutton. 
parking was tight, but by some miracle, our host Gaetano squeezed his little car into space, even smaller than his car. <laughs> I say miracle because the action, actual maneuver was a blur of lar loud arguing between our driver and concerned passers-by. Furious gestures mixed with spontaneous, spont spontaneous groans and sighs. All of this within five minutes, then calmness reigned again. We had spent the afternoon at Assisi. It became clear that St. Francis had extended his compassion to Gaetano, who was received as if he was, were the mayor everywhere we went. At this point, I no longer panicked at the ordinary Italian conversation. The first time it seemed, the first time the whole table erupted into loud chaos, it seemed that a great wrong had been uncovered. I was alarmed yet grateful for the, for the, the inclination for sustained silent observation. After everything reached a fever pitch, calmness instantly descended. It was then I realized that they were only figuring out the tip for the group's meal. <laughs> At Camarillo, we wound our way to the plaza, where large tents bustle with music, lights, and sizzling meat, and huge pans of onions, cooked in every way imaginable and unimaginable. <laughs> the onion was the star, and we mere celebrants. That was the night we lost Scott Mama Day. We left Spello and planned to sit together at one table as Gaetano negotiated for a table of 13. The rest wandered out loud where Dr. Mama Day was. We called Mar Carmen and Emma's cell phones to no avail. The drive from Spello was a matter of maneuvering in the moonlight through dark fields and rolling hills of olives, grapes, and fig trees. The narrow streets and parking lots were searched. Finally, there they were, strolling towards us, all smile and casual greetings. Where were you? Several voices demanded. We thought you were lost. For Gaetano Propolini, to lose Scott Mama Day would be the end of everything. Again, there was a loud eruption of questions, interrupted explanations, demands, and defenses. Throughout all this, Scott listened, leaning on his new walnut cane. He didn't look lost at all. But then, can a man be lost if he is accompanied by three women? With the lost party in place, we sat down to revel in the joys of the onion, as the night sky over Camerino filled with smoke, music, laughter, and wine. We ate gratefully reunited, savoring all varieties of roasted meats, succulent potatoes, flavorful vegetables, and crusty breads. We happily pay tribute with every bite and each story to the tangy, even sweet presence of the onion. Thank you. This is like choosing between my children. <laughs> I want to um, read a poem. Um, this is called Ahitsuke, and it means um, 
they are married or they are together. So I want to read this for my husband who is um, the president of um, American, uh, the uh, Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. And he has um, a really busy schedule too, so we have planned to come together, but he has to, um, he's just came back from traveling and is leaving again soon. So, um, in Navajo, the state of relationships is interesting. I, I really checked and did my own research into this. The end of the poem talks, talk, gives you the meaning. So anyway, it hits a cat, and I'll talk a little bit about it. It's not a grand thing after all, just that warm comfort and murmuring good night before I sink into that dark quiet that exists when we're together. Otherwise, when I'm traveling, the same good night on the phone, and I listen intently for what I'm not sure. Have a light on for safety, drift off to sleep half listening. A little noise and I'm sitting up in bed surveying the room. Sometimes even the entire block from the hotel window. I rush to the phone and double check. Should I dial zero or eight nine eight nine one one? I check the locks again, then lie back down, afraid to sleep, yet wanting to sleep, knowing that fatigue will be obvious in the morning. I've had so much practice. When we're together, locking doors doesn't occur to me. Local crime seems to be far away. Never mind that we are in the heart of the city. I insist upon complete darkness, and what I am sure of is that if I turn over, your warm chest or arms will surround me. That should I awaken, confused as to where I am, once again, you will reach for me, knowing exactly how to reassure me. And when we drink coffee together in this bright California morning, mountains <coughs> towering around us, I move, I move closer to knowing what the Creator meant by Nizhunago Ahitsike. They are sitting beside each other in a house of beauty. So they are sitting beside each other inside a house of beauty. So when people are courting, or when they're just like dating, um, they say that assured. And that means you can't do that. It, when you literally translate it, it means like they're holding on to each other and kind of like uh, maybe stumbling or dragging each other around. Like you're so in love, you just love, love hanging on to each other and you can barely walk. <laughs> But you can't do that unless it's so da, uh, da sure. You can't really do that. I mean, the, the description of it, you have to be outside. So it's, so it's like in the moonlight, under the trees, behind buildings, whatever. It's like you're outside. And then as you're becoming more serious, it, it, the relationship begins to sort of move towards the interior. So like when you're going together, it means outside. But then when you're married and you're settled in together, that's when you're indoors. So, it ha so it's just interesting like how relationships are described in um, different ways. So I, I, um, that's what I was thinking about when I was, um, well, I, yeah, that occurred to me as I was writing this poem that, that was the way that, um, that was how relationships are um, characterized. I really like thinking about uh, what Navajo words mean and where they originated, all the different parts of it. It's all the different parts of it. It's so descriptive and so visual and so like emotion driven that um, it has a whole different 
concept than the word with in English. So for instance, this next poem is called Nanes Kade, and it refers to um, what we would normally just call tortillas. When the weather is nice, we sit under the trees with covered bowls of warm dough and make bread on grills set over glowing ashes. More often, we sit in my mother's kitchen and take turns placing flattened circles of dough on the hot griddle. The stack of bread alternately grows, then shrinks, depending on how many people are around. These days, I drive home in the darkened evening to a quiet house. The cats greet me with a glance and a yawn. They look repeatedly at their food bowls. They want canned food. It seems like everyone wants something from me, I complain while filling their bowls. Dexter Dudley Begay purrs in response. I wish for beans or warm stew. But then I just wash my hands and line up ingredients, as I learned to do in home economics long ago. Never start cooking without everything being in order, Mrs. Bowman preach. I, change, I mix the dough and cover it, then let it set a while. I change clothes, turn on lights, and fix a glass of ice water. Then I search the refrigerator for something to accompany the nanes kade. It goes with everything and anything, my inner Martha Stewart reassures me. <laughs> the process is simple. Take a few handfuls of flour, preferably bluebird or Navajo pride. Toss with a bit of salt and a palm full of baking powder. Mix well. Ponder the next ingredient a while, but then go ahead and add two fingertips of lard. Not too much, just enough to help the texture. Mix very well, then pour in one and a half cups of very hot water and mix quickly. Mix until the dough forms a soft ball and the remaining flour lifts away from the sides of the bowl. Rub olive oil on a griddle and heat until very warm. Then take a ball of dough and slap it into a disc. Stretch it gently while Stretch it gently while slapping it back and forth from hand to hand. After a few minutes, a rhythm emerges from the soft muffle slapping, combined combine with the pauses to lay the dough on the griddle. Flip it over. It's removal from the hot grill and it's quick replacement. Soon the kitchen warms and the warms and the fresh scent of nanes kade drifts through the house. The cats are now sleeping circles of fur. The door opens. My husband comes in smiling. He is savoring nanes kade and melting butter. And then this is what the word means. Na. Here, as in na kadil wal. That's what we say to the kids. Here, now, go run along, go play. After you give them a, a little piece of dough. Na. For you, Dina Ishla, I made this for you. Na, Dina Ishla, here I made this for you. Na, Hishkad, I slapped this dough into shape for you. Dina Neselkad, this warm circle of dough is spread out for you. Kadla, there, Lakanish. Is it good? <laughs> I want to read this poem. Um, let's see. I want to read um, a villanelle, which is also fixed form. This is called Near to the Water. And a villanelle is a poem of 19 lines, and it has, uh, it has a rhyme scheme of ABA, and then it has a quatrain at the end, and it has repeating lines. So, um, near to the water means 
or yeah, near to the water means near to the water. Tuachane <laughs> um, is the name near to the water. Nista is where my father's from. Hanaba is um, a variation of my mother's name, which is Hanespa. And um, I wanted to write this poem for my father, who in his last years of life and last months of life would not, real, would not eat anything but blue corn. It's things made of blue corn. And um, uh, I wanted to honor that and to honor my father. I have to say that Brianna doesn't really remember her Che, my father, but he had, he was so close to her. He didn't really speak, he was, he, he didn't really speak English a lot, but he would talk Navajo to her and she was about three or four and they could understand each other. And when she came into the room, when he was in the hospital, he would put out her, his hand for her and they would just hold hands. We lift caught her up so that she could see him. He, I, he just was so close of his grandchildren to her. And she actually looks kind of like my father. Her, my father was um, light complected for Navajo. Near to the water. Most afternoons at Nist are when the sky is a brilliant teal, Hanaba is at the sunlit stove tending the speckled enamel pot. The Havan is redolent of simmering soup and blue cornmeal. As a child, Hanaba learned to blend the fine cornmeal in the still mountain mornings. The quiet cadence of the stirring spoon brought forth her mother's voice on those days when the sky was a brilliant teal. Later, when Tua'ahane saw the red sunset in Hanabat's hair, it instilled such an ancient longing, like the lilting grinding songs that wrought childhood repasts, warm bread, simmering soup, and blue cornmeal. On cold, quiet nights, the elders tell of how a woman's long hair reveals enduring wisdom. They say changing woman's hair averted drought on a dusty, hot afternoon centuries ago when the sky was a brilliant teal. For Tkoahane, the glistening of Hanabat's hair recall the low peal of distant thunder when thin corn stalks rippled in dry fields and sought cool rain. Now her hagan is redolent of simmering soup and blue cornmeal. As Hanabat stirs the enamel pot in the low winter dusk, her songs yield memories of Tua'ahane, his resonant voice and dark eyes. The decades have taught Hanaba that those long ago afternoons and skies of brilliant teal are the quintessence of stories simmering soup and blue cornmeal. So I want to read this poem, um, maybe two more poems, and then um, turn it over to Shelley. This is a poem called Afternoon in Yotua. And Yotua is the um, Navajo name for Santa Fe. It means beads of clear, cold, a necklace made of beads of clear, cold water. The Santa Fe afternoon is warm and bright. The dogs are delirious to be outdoors. They prance about panting loudly. Simmer down, guys, I say. They don't have to wear jackets today. Once my husband said they were embarrassed to wear jackets. I never saw an embarrassed dog, I said. <laughs> he just smiled. A few months ago on another warm afternoon, 
My mother sat on the comfortable old couch in front of the wood stove. The stove is in the center of the house where it is dim and cool. After straightening the kitchen, I sat beside her. Uh, I said, leaning against her. This means tell me stories or tell me what's going on. She said, that's all. We both laughed. I adjusted the pillow behind her head as she leaned back. I slipped my hand into hers and leaned against her. Her hands are warm and thin. Unlike mine, she has slim, elegant fingers. She patted my hand and we were silent. We were alone in the quiet house. Across the road, a cow bellowed, and somewhere by the wash, dogs were barking playfully. One sounded like a puppy. Here in the living room, we rested, closing our eyes. She said, with her eyes still closed, let's sing. So I started a song and she joined in. I sang close to her so she could hear. We sang several songs. Then she started one and I was quiet. I don't know that one, I said, after she raised her head and looked at me. You do, she said. One time I heard you singing it. She kept on singing and after a while I got it and we finished. Hua, she said, like she was tired. She fell asleep. I kept holding her hand and leaning on her. I wanted to fall asleep, but couldn't. It seemed like there was too much going on, but it was just she and I sitting together on a late summer afternoon. Her cat, Kitty Ba, jumped on the couch and stretched out beside us. Kitty Ba and Mom always snapped at the same time. Today in Yotuo, there's snow on the highest peaks of the Sangri de Cristos, the mountain of the blood of Christ. The bright snow is startling against the deep blue sky. It's warm enough to use the screen door. The afternoon sun slants into the kitchen in thin lines. The dogs sleep on warm tile squares. It's mid-afternoon in Yotuo, where beads of clear cold water form an ancient necklace that encircle the Sangri de Cristos. And I'll end with this one. We must always remember the worlds our ancestors traveled. Always wear the songs they gave us. Remember, we are made of prayers. Now we leave wrapped in old blankets of love and wisdom. Ikeha I see. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I think, you know, some of us are here far from home, and it's always comforting to hear your stories, but to hear your voice, and to have you here with us at Harvard on what feels like a very gray day that mm -hmm. some of us have a hard time with when we come from the Southwest and the sunshine. Um, but you were here yesterday. You got to see the lovely weather that we can have here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a couple questions. Um, and the first one, 
a couple of years ago, you were named the inaugural Navajo Nation Poet Laureate. Mm -hmm. I'm sure to the delight of probably every Navajo Nation member, that seems the most fitting. You were the person that should have been named for that. But tell me, what, what do you think the significance is of that? How did Navajo Nation, what does it mean for Navajo Nation to have a poet laureate? Um, so most nations have poet laureates. And the Navajo Nation is the first indigenous nation in the country that has named a poet laureate. So I think it very much speaks to our, our um, sense of ourselves as a nation and to our sense of sovereignty. And then to, it also really rec recognizes our legacy and our lives today as a people who, are, who love language, who, who are wrought from language, from stories and prayers and songs. As a Navajo person, that's, you know, to be alive now and today over the centuries, that was what sustained us and that was what saved us. And that's what today it still gives us that essence. So um, it, it recognizes, I think, that, um, that history that is a spoken history and that is ingrained in our memories as well as recognizing um, what, what it means to be a poet in contemporary society. And I think it's even more um, significant that our poet laureate, our inaugural poet laureate, and our current poet laureate are women mm -hmm. who we recognize and honor and you know really kind of put you on a pedestal up there. As, a role model for not just younger women, but for all of us and mm -hmm. for the entire Thank nation. You. So we learned a little bit today that we had lunch with students, and we learned that your poetry and your work really has an international reach, mm -hmm. and that some students have really related your work to their own cultures and some of the stories in their cultures. Mm -hmm. What do you like, what would you like kind of your audience, whoever they are and wherever they are in the world, to kind of come away with when they read your work? Um, I suppose that it would be um, an understanding or appreciation of our land and each of us, our, our place within the fabric of um, our ancestors, the stories, and our, our identity and our own distinct languages. And, um, and then to, to recognize or acknowledge that um, we belong to a family, or we belong to a family, a huge family that really loves stories. I was talking about this today and how you know when somebody says, guess what? And you know everybody goes, you know, we all like stories, so whatever it might be to be in that circle. Because in Navajo, when people share stories or when they talk to you, that means that you're within this circle of being um, appreciated and being loved and being um, honored. And that to be in that circle where you're being told stories and everybody's laughing, sometimes crying, it means that like you all have love each other, you're all appreciative of each other's presence and each other's voices. So to be told stories is at once to be, be shown that you're loved. And I think we've all heard stories where we walk away and say, oh, that was a real good story. Mm -hmm. I have to retell that You just feel, way. like, satisfied. That's right. And you remember <laughs> it and you think about it. And you laugh later, chuckle to yourself. <laughs> One of the things you talked about today with students was your choice to go and teach poetry mm -hmm. and do poetry workshops with students, but specifically to do it in a Navajo way your Navajo way of teaching. I wonder if you could tell the audience here, what, you, what, what do you mean by that, the Navajo way of teaching poetry? Mm -hmm. So um, when I was in graduate, undergraduate and graduate school, 
you know, we, as a creative writing student, we had a lot of poetry workshops. And so, um, in which you're, you know, the requirement is that you write a poem every week or so, an original poem. Then you read it to the class, everyone reads it, and then they comment on it. So it's called critiquing or analyzing your poem. And I have been in many workshops where um, when a person's poem came up many times, students and even the professors would just be really critical. And students would run from the room in tears and like drop their majors and it was just so devastating. It really hurt me to see that and um, I, I just knew that if I was teaching poetry, if that was my classroom, I wouldn't, that wouldn't happen. It was so unnecessary to me because it didn't only hurt whoever was wrote that poem, it hurt the whole class. We just sat there in silence, not knowing what to say after the professor would just kind of tear into a, person, a student. So um, when I then began to teach, I very much established the fact that I'm Navajo, and I talked about how we were, um, one of the things that I tell is the story of the first laugh. When the baby first laughs in Navajo, we have, when they first laugh, like in recognition to somebody, what's somebody's smile, or like they recognize like in themselves as they respond to a person. And it doesn't count when they laugh in their sleep or, you know. But when they recognize another human being, and they make that connection. When a baby first laughs out loud, we it's such a celebration because it means the baby has moved out of the world of the holy people, where babies exist before they're born and after they're born. They exist like with, they live in our world, but they really have a consciousness of the holy people. When they laugh, they move, they become part of us as a people that live on this earth. They become part of the human family. So we celebrate that um, because that was what was first done for changing women, who's our, who's our, who's our principal deity. Um, so she, when she first laughed, they had a big party for her because it was an utterance of her breath. And, um, and, and they celebrated it, and we celebrate it because we want the baby to always be happy. And then we have a big dinner. Whoever makes the baby laughs funds the dinner. <laughs> so I always tell my students, if you're waiting for a financial aid check, don't go making babies laugh. <laughs> you have to be able to afford it. So you're responsible for the whole dinner. And people do it very happily. And then during this dinner, during the celebration, during the ceremony, the baby assumes the role of changing a woman, boy or girl. And they, the baby, everybody lines up. Since you're in the presence of a holy person and a deity, you line up and then you can ask the baby, whisper to the baby who's now changing a woman, any wish that you want, anything that you want, so that's one reason people like to go to these dinners, <laughs> these ceremonies, because you get to meet a holy person and you tell them like this. Is, but the, the, the thing is that when you ask for what you want, since it's all in humor and celebrating humor, you ask backwards. <laughs> so like a little boy may say, may I marry a real ugly woman? But they mean the opposite of that. And so they're really funny, you know, because everybody's asking for things opposite. The baby gives out gifts. They put, the baby puts corn pollen um, or salt in everybody's palm as they whisper wishes to her. And the baby is also has a big, um, just a big pile of fruit, gifts, toys, all kinds of little stuff. So they give each person a gift. So you, the holy person not only hears your wish, but you get a gift from the holy person. And um, so we, and we have, as, there's 
a lot of people there because we don't want to be the baby to ever be lonely, to be anywhere without relatives. So, and we don't want the, the baby to just be wandering around by themselves. We always want them to know that this is their home. So to, and then also for the baby not to be stingy, not to be saying, that's mine, leave that alone, to always be generous and to share what they have. So that has to do with like the breath. So in Navajo, they say the sacred begins at the tip of my tongue. So when you can hear, feel your breath when you're talking, you're putting the sacred out into the world. And the sacred is when you first take your first breath, it enters through all your fingertips and the whirl on top of your head. So they always say your fingertips aren't just for the FBI. <laughs> it means that different kind, all the different kinds of wind enter your fingertips when you're Take your first breath after you're born. And when, you know, I don't know if they still slap a baby, but you know, the first breath in this world. So you're imbued with that sacred, those sacred winds. Every time you speak or express yourself, you're expressing the sacred. So that's what I talk about in my creative writing classes, that every poem that they created has never existed before. It now exists, and it's, they put it into the world. Therefore, we have to honor that. And so we're there to say what you really like about the poem, and then to make suggestions to make it tighter and more refined. But we don't ever, you know, that defeats the whole, call, whole like premise of creation. You can't be creative if you're afraid of what people are going to say. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's good to kind of tell not just students but individuals that when you write, you you know not to be afraid of how it's going to sound mm -hmm. or what's going to be put out there. Mm -hmm. um, and back to the first laugh, it's always difficult when a baby's two to three months. Thank you. The first question when you see the baby is to the parents is, has the baby laughed? Mm -hmm. And if it's a no, you walk away. <laughs> you don't want to be around the baby. <laughs> And then there are parents who invite certain people over during that mm -hmm. stage because they really hope that they'll talk to the baby and make the baby laugh because they can throw a good party. A really, <laughs> a really good party. <laughs> so I feel bad for babies sometimes between two or three months. You don't know if people are around you and want to be around you or, or they're purposely trying to be there for a reason. Um, we have a couple of minutes, so I didn't know if there was a question from the audience. Yeah. Um, I have heard that um, puns are a really important part of the Navajo language, punning and humor. And I wonder if that plays a role in your poetry at all. Give me an example of a pun. <laughs> <laughs> when is a door not a door? What? When is a door not a door? When it's a jar. I see. <laughs> I thought you meant adore, like, I adore you. <laughs> I'm sure there are. I'm trying to think of... Yeah, it depends on like, how you say certain things. So, for instance, well, it's not really a pun, but it show, sort of shows you the creativity of Navajo language. You know, I was reading the poem about Tzili, which means it's like a little bitty dog, like a chihuahua, that's really, there's a whole story behind that, huh, about it's illy, how they saved a little boy. So we don't normally let dogs in our house, but we let the little bitty ones in because they once saved a little boy. And so we really kind of revere those little dogs. Anyway, um, in that poem, I talked about the names of dogs. There was Lobo, Snazzy, and Oki. And Oki actually means like, oh, means like fur. I mean, no, it means grass. But when you say Oki, it means like furry. So it, there's like different meanings depending on how you say it. Um, I'm sure there's other examples. It's a really kind of precise language. So without knowing, uh, sometimes you can say the wrong thing that you didn't mean, but well, just because of a syllable. And I'm sure that there's puns, but I, somehow I can't think of. Um, if you said that in Navajo, I could probably think of it. <laughs> <laughs>
but puns, I don't know. Uh, oral history is itself very beautiful, and mm -hmm. some would argue it's poetic. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think back to the history of uh, Navajo language and uh, kind of the relationship to poetry, wh wh where are the origins and where are the boundaries between uh, the beauty of oral history and the kind of speci specificity of Navajo poetry? I can only speak to Navajo poetry, um, not necessarily. You mean Navajo oral history? I think they're so interwoven, it's so replete with various kinds of like really precise, intricate verbal expressions that, uh, and there's not really a word for po in poetry for, na for po in Navajo for poetry. You can say um, zad, sad, which means it means language, it means like what a person says, but it also encompasses stories, knowledge, wisdom, songs. It encompasses of a whole variety of knowledge, and it means that a person knows their history, they know their origin, they, un they understand um, the meaning of the mountains and the different directions, different stones, where the origin is. You know the origin of your clothes. So there's a word for that, and it is sad, and it just has a very general meaning, and that's where poetry exists as well as stories. But it doesn't exist as it does in English by itself. It's embodied in all this self-knowledge, all this knowledge. Yeah, thank you. That was a good question. Um, we have one more, and then we'll be done. So I'm wondering if you could talk about when you decide to translate Navajo in your poems and when you decide not to. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It just kind of happens. I really don't. It's not really conscious. I know that like when I'm writing a sestina, I'll already kind of have the words in mind. Then. So some words have so many different varied meanings that it's easier to do things in Navajo, use Navajo words than it is in English. But it's not really, it's kind of what, you know, as a poet and as a writer, I write all the time. And it's really what the story or the poem or the vignette wants to be. And it's like, as. So I'm, on, I'm the person that writes it down, but it's not really my, you know, I write it down, but I don't invent it. It just sort of fits, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you again, Lucy, from Radcliffe and Hunap. We have a very nice Hunap coffee mug for you for your Hills Brothers coffee. Oh, thank you. <laughs> for your Starbucks. Thank you.